This is part two of our shop tour at Hagedorn Racing Engines. Today we're going to see how Terry makes all that horsepower and the tech behind it. Later on in this video, we'll show you a huge motor running in the dyno room and learn more about how those are used. So stick around for all the fun. Okay, so now we're down here in the other shop. And this was this what you call your motor shop, or? Yeah, this is where we assemble all the engines and do all the machine work. <laughs> Just doing engine work rather than trying to do fab work and motor work out of the same shop. And so, tell me what you got some new machines since I've been here. Tell me what some of this stuff does. This is a Sun and SV10 home. Between having the machine work, the dyno, computer programs to design motors. You kind of use it all and uh, try to figure out what works the best. That's kind of how I stay ahead of my competition. We spend a lot of time and effort in getting a cylinder ring seal. This machine here has a programmable, you can program the crosshatch pattern in your, in your uh, cylinders. Right. <clears throat> you can act, and you can duplicate it and we use a combination of diamond and stone to uh, get the cylinders exact. So this thing runs on what? 223 phase? Or? Yes. 223 phase. Which American Rotary has got our phase converter program up to speed it's computer friendly and it's quiet so pure sine wave probably guaranteed not to harm any of your electronics english dutch spanish <laughs> so which version do you normally we run usually in? run english on it most of the time I got you. <laughs> you program everything in on this thing you program the bore diameter the bore length the okay. length of stone that you're uh, going to use, or diamond, the over top stroke. Uh, let's see, we'll just program something in here so you can see. Four inch bore. So I program in the bore diameter, the gotcha. bore length, the length of the honing stone that we would use in there, or the diamond. The over stroke, the over stroke is how far it comes out of the top and how far it comes out of the bottom. So you don't have a, so it makes an even cylinder all the way through. Gotcha. Now, it gives you recommendations for stock motors, okay. but you're on your own when you go to racing engines. Your older machines were either hand operated or air assisted. You had no idea what cross hatch angle you were putting in it. Even if you were trying to duplicate it from cylinder to cylinder, it's impossible. You just eyeball it and yell, that looks good. That's what we used to do 20 years ago. Okay. Now we have programs that we change for depending on what the motor is going to be used for and what type of fuel and what type of RPM. <clears throat> That's where and, all the top secret stuff comes into play. Right? Yes, that takes years of running the home changing uh, home patterns, putting it on a dyno, see what happened. So there's a trade-off between how long it's gonna last and how much power to make. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so if you're working for maximum power, let's say, and you're gonna run drag race motor 200 runs a season, it will require a different honing pattern than if you're gonna run a drag race engine, you're looking for all out horsepower and you're going to freshen it every 15 or 20 rounds wow. and when you uh, turn it on put it in the cylinder it'll actually detect a tight or a loose spot in there and if it detects a tight spot it will stop the stroke take the tight spot out and then resume honing what machines do you feel like has helped your operation the most as far as you know, made you a better engine builder, this would have to be one of them. This is one of the top pieces of equipment that makes horsepower. I gotcha. It's just a, it's not a process that you're gonna learn in 
at a race school right. or in three weeks at a shop. Gotcha. I've been doing motors for 30 years. We probably increased our motor quality more in the last seven years than we have since I started, just by the equipment that we're using. The biggest deal is, is we try to match the motor for what the customer wants to do, not just sell them a cookie cutter engine for and make it work for their use. We try to build it for exactly what they're gonna do with it. You, you do we do a lot of machine work for people that wanna do their own motors. We do engine balancing, engine block boring and honing, uh, cylinder head work, uh, flow testing. I do header design for customers where they trying to match up their motor to the exhaust system on the car. Um, part of the screen. The second piece of equipment that gets the horsepower out of them is this uh, Rottler guide and seat machine. It's kind of my pride and joy because it does an awesome valve job. Cool. Then we try to set the shop up so it's user friendly. We got the guide and seat machine, the valve resurfacer right beside it so when we uh, grind a valve and we're doing the seats we use uh, bluing to uh, check the uh, seat location and width. Uh, when we first started we used tools like this and lapping compound to make sure that they were seated. Now we use a vacuum gauge stick it over the port, turn the vacuum gauge on, it pulls 20 inches of vacuum, it's done. You don't want to degrade the quality of the valve job by putting lapping compound on it and grinding it in there. A lot of people that haven't been keeping up on motor work ask if you do a three angle valve job. Well, the angles on these deals are infinite. We buy specific cutters for specific jobs. You have one angle and seat width, it would be like 45 degrees and 90 thousandths thick. The rest of it is a radius. There is no three angle valve jobs anymore. There are like a hundred angle valve jobs. <laughs> wow. So, wow. And they make all different cutters actually design some of my own for different uh, applications that we're running. A lot of the motors now are going to high performance motors with over an inch lift or using 60 degree seats, which is unheard of. The tractor head that we're working on right there behind us has a 29 degree seat. They used that back in the 30, still using it on low flow applications and Okay. industrial equipment. So this is this is the new motor for the new truck next year? Or just yes, next? it's going to be, we're going to be testing it this fall. Haven't had time to put it together yet. Just finished getting all the parts for it here. Uh, VED engine development. Uh, has been working with me and I've designed this entire new motor. Brand new cylinder head, new billet block. This motor is going to be state of the art and it's going to make some serious horsepower. The blocks are probably 100 pounds lighter than a cast iron block, okay. but that's not the reason we run. The billet material is so much stronger that it'll take the horsepower without distorting. This is the engine balancer that we use. A lot of customers come in here and have had their motors balanced somewhere else. They're having main bearing problems and uh, we'll tear it down and come find out they're off as much as 70, 80, 90, 100 grams from being balanced. Uh, and at higher PM that generates hundreds of pounds of 
force on the main bearing caps. <clears throat> so if you take the time to get the balance perfect where it goes to zero total balance, you can run a 18, 1900, 2000 horse motor for 50, 60 passes, and when you take the main caps off of it, you can't tell he started the motor. Yeah, this is the dyno room. A lot of exciting things happen in here some days. <laughs> for customers that have not been around a dyno before, I've had some of them run outside and throw up. When you put it in his room and look through that window and you crank it up to seven, eight, nine, ten thousand RPM and you're sitting there staring at it, some people can't handle that too well. <laughs> <laughs> Bulletproof glass? Yeah, it's uh, this room is uh, designed by our local heat and air condition. We took all of the specs from Superflow and Power Test and because it's a little confusing when you start trying to build a dyno room what the requirement is because everybody has a little bit different idea. So when I did it, I had used other people's dynos and there were things I didn't like about them. <clears throat> Mainly, a lot of it was the room. So we took all the manufacturer's recommendations and kind of combined them, looked what was common between them. And then I went to the local heat and air conditioning people and we come up with a game plan to exchange the air in this particular room 15 times a minute without creating any back pressure whatsoever. Eight horse tube fan that sucks air in and blows it down across the engine into the intake and then exits the back of the room and it does all that without making any uh, back pressure in the room so it doesn't affect your fuel readings or setup. So there's a lot so of science behind this just, just in the room design. This dyno will repeat a thousand horse motor down to a half a horse which when you're building upper end motors, if you're building a 600 horse motor and you put some parts on it and you make 700, you're not caring about one or two horsepower. But when you build a 1500 horse motor and you spend $7,000 on the cylinder heads or whatever you're doing to the motor and you're only gonna realistically gain 25 horsepower on a good scenario. If your dyno is not repeatable within a half a percent, you'll be chasing your tail all day because one reading will give you a 25 horse increase, the next one will give you a 5 horse increase, the next pass may be a 10 horsepower gain uh, loss, <clears throat> so you don't even know if you're tuning it right. How is this different? I've seen them where you actually pull up and they put the wheels on a roller. and How well, is that different? chassis dyno you're looking at where you know inward result horsepower which is fine but about the only tool that they have to check anything on the motor is a o2 sensor coming out the tailpipe or the header that's fine if you know your tune-ups close but on a motor dyno we monitor everything and we don't just stick it on the dyno so this is apples and oranges then basically because they're looking at foot pounds to the ground kind of a thing maybe? Well, it's still the same type of horsepower. The problem is, if you put a car on a chassis dyno that you built yourself, you really don't have an idea of what to set the fuel system, and you're just going off some guy that's sitting in an office a thousand miles away giving you a generic reading, you're liable to blow the engine or, tow or damage it severely before you even know you have a problem. Okay. We're on the motor dial, we're looking at fuel consumption, exhaust temperatures, air intake, everything, and we'll do it in stages like we may start at 3,500 and only go to 4,500. 
take a snapshot of all the readings, see if it's safe, then go from 3,500 to 5,500, another snapshot, and do that consistently till we get it up to 8,500 or 9,000, and it's not hurting itself. I mean, we even simulate the tailpipes and exhaust with different mufflers and stuff in here if they're going to run an exhaust. So they can take it to a chassis dyno and stick it on there and have an end result in a half hour, but they're liable to damage the motor before they ever get the result they want. So, especially on a new motor, this would be a lot safer and, and a lot, lot more. safer. Um, and maybe the chassis dyno down the road if they just need to do a quick touch up to see where they're at. Right, or see if the motor's got a problem. The, the advantage to the chassis dyno is if you, if you, if you're a really serious racer, you need both. You dial the motor in on a, on a motor dyno, you put it in the car, and now you're checking transmission, torque converter, everything on the car. You're checking the exhaust routing, if you've got an intercooler on it, you're making sure all that's working right and you're getting the end result that you should at the tire. Well, let me ask you this, are you noticing supply chain problems like everybody oh else? Oh my gosh, it's unbelievable, terrible. Okay. Uh, so you guys are affected by that as well. well. You never know what's not available until you call and try to order. We're waiting on a carburetor on the motor we're doing in the next room here. Uh, tried to order it. Uh, last week and they told me it's not available till the middle of September So the motor's done waiting on the carburetor. Oh, we waited four and a half months on the cylinder head bolts from ARP On both had all the motor parts laying here except for the cylinder head bolts I don't think people realize just how much I mean just from talking this afternoon How much science there is and, and tech goes into all this stuff as far as you know because you're, you're dealing with so many more RPMs than a normal motor is. This is not this is not shade tree mechanic stuff at all. I mean, it's no. Really not. One of my customers on the black Ford over there got ready to leave the other night after they dropped the truck off and said, "You never told us we were going to have to be a dirt agronomist or whatever, an engineer, <laughs> a mechanic, <laughs> and uh, also make my wife happy when I get home." <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot more to it if you want to win. Now, if you want to go out and just have a good time, then we build just street motor, and we want to build something that's going to last, that you can enjoy and get in it and just go eat supper. Gotcha. And uh, if a local hot rod guy pulls up alongside of you, maybe you'll embarrass him a little bit. <laughs> hey, we appreciate you taking this shop tour with us at Hagedorn Racing Engines. We appreciate Terry pulling back the curtain and showing us around. Craftsmanship takes many forms, and Terry is a true craftsman at what he does. Anything surprise you in this video? Leave a comment below. And hey, if you enjoyed this video, we would sure appreciate you hitting that like button, and we'd love it if you'd subscribe so you don't miss our other videos. Until next time, get out in your shop and make something cool.